Sally Stone's work addresses a significant issue of interpretation and reuse of the already constructed, that is, buildings, landscapes, interiors, and situations. The study, development, and redevelopment of the existing environments from the great, uh, from the great to the detailed scales includes the intangible, the tangible and intangible aspects of the constructed environment and is a key factor in determining how cultural heritage can be understood in the present and translated into future use. This demonstrates an acute grasp of the shifting social, cultural, and ecological context within which, within which the subject of architecture and interiors is understood and taught, while also reflecting the future-oriented, sustainable, and heritage-informed nature of the discipline in the 21st century. And so, Sally Stone's work has contributed to the rise of adaptive reuse as a newly emergent area of disciplinary expertise by proposing a definition for the subject, offering a new methodology for the analysis, development, and design of adaptive reuse architecture. And this methodology has come to serve as a prominent reference point for the education of both interiors and architecture students across the globe. Sally Stone is the program leader for the MA Architecture and Adaptive Reuse Program and the director of continuity in the Architecture Atelier at Manchester School of Architecture and is a visiting professor at the IUAV in Venice. So Sally's come a long way to come visit us here today, so I look forward to hearing your talk and thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, a great pleasure and excitement uh, to be here. Uh, I press that. Right. The uh, future of the already built, or FAB, which um, if any of you know, uh, the Thunderbirds um, uh, puppet show is, is very much part of that, but FAB, fab. So why have I been invited? It was a thank you for that um, lovely introduction, but uh, there's a um, sort of 30 years worth of uh, writing, exploring, um, trying to understand what this, what this subject is. And um, that's sort of those beginnings in Manchester, one of the great uh, post-industrial cities with a whole uh, surplus of buildings and what to do with them is sort of forms the basis of this. But the research also includes um, exhibitions, and this is one uh, just before COVID. Uh, in the Radical Gallery in Castleville Gallery in Manchester. And what was nice about this, this was an exhibition that discussed the similarity of the approach that artists would take and architects and designers and interior designers would take to the built environment and how the, the, um, the outcomes were radically different. And what was nice also, I really liked about this, was we commissioned uh, an artist to use the previous exhibition to build the new one. So we were reusing, um, uh, we were showing what reuse was when we were actively participating in reuse as well. And my, my work also includes activism. So we were really significant in saving this building, uh, the Preston bus station, which the council, uh, it's right in the city centre and it is a bit of a blocker and urban wise, it doesn't particularly well work. So the council thought, we'll knock it down, we'll make it into a surface car park, and then it's a piece of land that a developer will use. And yet, it's an incredibly significant part of the city. And so these are my students. And we built a huge model of the, of the building and paraded it through the streets. And during this, this campaign, which lasted maybe eight, nine months, this building went from, according to the local newspaper, the most hated building in Preston to the most loved building in Preston. Um, the 20th Century Society were also involved. They were coming at it from above. We were coming at it from below. And uh, it, was, it, it was listed. So uh, the council now have to deal with this huge modernist um, building in the this, this city centre, but it was worth it. But also st students, um, of architecture students of interiors and of course architects and interiors have this ability to imagine different futures and that's what's quite significant about you lot you can imagine a different scenario for a place for a building for a situation and uh, when this again is the uh, is in Preston this is the city art gallery and uh, 
the gallery commissioned some architects to update the building. It was a shocking project. It was so bad. And I thought, I've, I've got to do something. So my students, they all did alternative schemes. And we got these, uh, we got these published in the national press, in the architectural press. And in the end, the gallery began to realize that maybe they'd made a mistake. And they exhibited them in the gallery as well. So, so this idea of activism doesn't have to be shouting in the streets. It could actually be making design proposals. And that's what, that is what we do. We can, all, we can um, imagine alternative futures. I lead an atelier continuity in architecture, which has this understanding of place as the basis of it. And this is a couple of students, one from um, China, one from Rochdale, which is a small town to the north of Manchester, working on projects in Rochdale, working with the city council, working with the naval planning schemes, uh, planning um, uh, office, and working with some interest groups. These are sort of paid, funded projects, where the students, again, are looking at the city and making proposals for it. And this includes, well, new builds because it's architecture, but also a lot of um, uh, rebuild, uh, uh, adaptive reuse within that um, as well. So these are this, this, these students making proposals. Now, Rochdale has a very, very strange demographic. It's uh, to the north of Manchester, one of those post-industrial towns, with a very, very high um, Muslim pop population, with a very high um, uh, population from India and from Pakistan who came over to work in the mills in the post-war, post-Second World War period. And these students looked at the facilities for these people and they said there's lots for the kids to do, there's lots for the men to do, there's very, very little for the women to do. And they've become almost a hidden uh, demographic within the population. So this becomes a, a bathhouse for meeting, for women to meet, for um, to, for them to take part, for them to become much more part of uh, society. So, and this goes down to absolute detailed design. And the MA Architecture and Adaptive Reuse. This is, a, again, another student project. We were working with uh, the University in Hasselt on it. And this project looked at uh, Leopold II. He actually owned the Congo himself, not the country. This is, this is taking colonisation to the extreme, and he was an incredibly cruel um, man. And there's this great monument to him in the middle of the city. And these students were working on what could be done with this monument to demonumentalize it. So these series of models and um, the idea of, well, do you hide it? Do you hide it? But actually, sometimes it's quite important to keep hold of these things, to remember it doesn't just monumentalise what the you know the magnificence of this person. It can actually you remember the sort of the shocking behaviour, and uh, the the country in a way being complicit with that as well. So this series of uh, this uncomfortable past, this contested heritage, uh, sinister heritage. So they tried. They thought, oh, we'll put an amusement park there, but actually what they ended up doing was was smashing the urban pattern. So as soon as it becomes this axis is compromised, then this just becomes another element within the dense urban pattern. And the urban pattern, the grain, came from the city. So these sort of projects are born from the earth that come from an, an understanding of what's there and a, and a, a knowledge, a, a research knowledge of what is there. But adaptive reuse um, itself for such a long established and deeply entrenched subject, it's got a remarkably short history. And it's a practice that stretches back to almost the first constructed buildings themselves, for structures have permanently been altered to accommodate the needs of their different occupants, and yet has continually lacked the recognition of new build architecture. And it's interesting, adaptive reuse, it's a verb. It's a verb. And exact title has still yet to uh, emerge from that or an exact definition and it can be referred to and it's interesting the different the different um, words that 
described it or different definitions for it. And some of them are incredibly proactive and they're sort of almost quite macho in the way they are. And some of them really start to understand the sort of symbiotic quality of the subject itself. So we've got interior architecture, remodeling, building, reuse, retrofitting, conversion, uh, adaptation, rehabilitation, reworking, sometimes refurbishment. Um, and a, just a quick look at the... There's a huge number of them. And this isn't even all of them. Adaptive reuse, interior architecture, modification, rehabilitation, reconditioning, interventions, reworking, remodeling, repurposing. Now, that's words that I hadn't really come across that much until I came to Canada, repurposing. So it's like there's so many words for it, and yet um, it implies change. And the function is usually the most obvious change. It's not always change in function, but other alterations may be made to the building such as the circulation routes, the orientation, the relationship between the spaces, additions may be built, other areas may be de demolished. And like I said, for an incredibly old subject with a remarkably short history. So if we go to the Roman arena in Nîmes, which was then used uh, as a village, it was just gradually occupied um, by the local people who really just used it as a building material. It was there. They were the walls of the building. And so now you can see it directly transplanted. The Palladios Basilica in Verona uh, was the old market hall. This is a new wall, a new wall to clad the whole building in. The whole building was just recladded in this, uh, reclad in this what, Surlian, um double column. To, which very nicely takes out any of the discrepancies in the, um, uh, the measurements of the building. So, although these are all the same distance apart, the, sorry, the arches are all the same distance apart, these aren't. So, it just allows what was an irregular building to become regular. This building, um, after the Second World War, they put a new roof on it, this uh, <laughs> copper, the copper roof, and they made it of concrete, and it was so heavy that it was just pushing the walls out, just bit by bit. And two years ago, they took that new roof off and put a new one on, using exactly the same technology that it was originally constructed with. So they did know something. Uh, the John Soane House in London, a beautiful uh, Georgian articulation of... Um, uh, spaces and forms but that uh, was original building that he reused so this idea of reuse being around these are uh, houses in Manchester my own uh, hometown um, typical uh, brick terrace houses there's thousands and thousands of these all over the city and these this particular area has been updated for the uh, the needs and the wishes of a 21st century population, which are different to a 19th century population who first occupied this. Our needs, our wants are quite different. So they've been updated. Um, uh, a building that's just sort of been cut about and messed around, so you get a sort of this idea of the palimpsest, the two working together. Something very incredibly sculptural um, from Heatherwick, um, the idea that how do we judge whether a building is worth saving? I mean, this is some silos some, uh, in South Africa. And 10, 15 years ago, would they, would they have been saved? And, of course, uh, the forks in, in Winnipeg, which then uh, starts to question why we save things and what we are saving. Because... Buildings outlast civilizations. Uh, they evolve and they're changed, but their reduce emphasizes continuity. A building can retain a remembrance of the form of function and value, and it has a memory of its previous purpose ingrained within its very structure. The exploitation and development of this can create a composite of meaning and consequence, and the inherent qualities of the place and its surroundings combined with the anticipation of the future use 
can produce a multi-layered complexity that is impossible to re replicate in a new building. So adaptive reuse, you've got that sense of history, you've got the sense of culture, you've got that sense of time, all in a symbiotic relationship. Um, and just a sort of example of that idea of the, the sense of two things together and uh, the way the sort of the culture of the previous existence can be um, combined with the culture and the needs of uh, 21st century users is the Spork Palace in Prague. And this is a 17th and 18th century amalgamation of three buildings, which it has a particularly um, sinister past to it because it was requisitioned by the Gestapo uh, during the Second World War and then um, by the Communist Party after the Second World War. So there's something very sinister, something very, very disturbing about uh, this. But this building, uh, Stanis Stanislav Fiala, um, was working on the building and it's been converted uh, into an office block. It's like quite a benign sort of thing. It's offices and people rent uh, a couple of floors, they have their business there, they've got some banks there, they've got some insurance agencies there, and it's very straightforward, very ordinary. And yet, that sense of the, um, the myths um, which uh, some of those sort of Czechoslovakian, Czech Republic myths come through with what's happening in the, uh, the bird, the, <laughs> the winged deer in the, um, the courtyard. And these are some of the spaces. It's a very nice conversion. Sometimes you get this, this sense of the history really coming through, the, with the way the, the, um, the walls are treated and the contrast with the new furniture. But there are these moments, just these moments in the, in the building that remind us of the sinister past to this. They remind us of there's something very, very uncomfortable about what happened in this building. So this is the lift lobby, and this sort of, this line of blood that just runs through it. And then um, this is in another one of the lobbies. And again, it's very simple, it's very subtle. And it's a little bit shocking when you go there because you think, I'm in an office block, and actually, you, suddenly you get this reminder. But the other reminder uh, within the building is the doors. It was a building with a lot of doors, a lot of rooms. And as you know, with modern office design, there's, uh, we like big spaces, we like big open spaces, not too many confined rooms. So what the architect did was start to collect these doors. Um, and collect them, and uh, so we've got these new spaces created and a load of surplus doors. And so he started to install these doors unnecessarily. And what ha what's going on behind these doors? There was always, you know, the closed door within a, uh, within a Gestapo building or within a communist building. I mean, I, we can only imagine from what we know from reading books and seeing films what goes on behind these doors but there are too many doors. There's places where there's too many doors. And that's, again, we've got in this sense of history, this sense of complexity that comes with reused building, adapted reused buildings, because they can tell stories. And we've been talking this morning about storytelling within architecture and interiors and landscapes. And again, the adapted building can tell a story that goes beyond the, the bricks. So you've got that sense of the tangible and the intangible histories, the virtual, the real, and the virtual qualities of, of something. So the, the interior architect, the, adapt, uh, the architect who engages in adaptive reuse is sort of a translator. They're translating the original building into uh, a new building, a new uh, edifice. And uh, Silvetti, in Interactive Realms talks about, at the risk of sounding too partisan and biased, I would say that even in historic times, documents were not always available. 
And buildings, and that's monuments, vernacular constructions, and public works, are these themselves important texts, often providing the first and most lasting impression of a culture. So this is what, as designers, as architects, we're reading. We're reading that culture and using it as the, the basis, as the translation. And Benjamin likens this act of translation to that of fragments of a broken vessel which are incorporated into the replica of the original, thus making both the original and the translation recognisable as fragments of a greater language. And consequently, buildings, structures and situations that are reused represent both the culture that originally constructed the building and also the society that remodelled it. And Already today, the metaphor of the palimpsest has been, has been used. And the palimpsest, that idea of writing over, of scraping away and writing something um, over that. And yet the remnants of that previous incarnation are still retained. And this is something uh, that uh, the great theoretician uh, Rodolfo Machado, Machado, I was told it's pronounced, um, write about the sort of the idea of the palimpsest, architecture as palimpsest, remodeling as palimpsest, remodeling as interpretation. And he, said, he talks about the idea that it's possible to consider the already built as a script upon which each designer will draw his or her interpretation. Each designer. And that's what's sort of significant. We all have different attitudes to it. And that's what's brilliant about architecture, brilliant about design. We'll all have these alternative futures that we can imagine within the adapted building. And if we think about the metaphor of the palimpsest, uh, if we look sort of at these, these great friezes in, in Greece, we see them like this. We see the sort of the purity of them. We see the, um, the wonderful marble and the material. But actually, they were like this. They were painted. Um, and it's very difficult for us to get our heads around the fact that they were gaudy and bright and they weren't sort of pure and um, clean like that. If we look... Um, this was during um, a riot a couple of... Uh, well, some years ago now, in, in uh, Britain. Some demonstration. I won't say riot. It was a demonstration. Um, but there was such an uproar in the UK about putting a Mohican on top of um, Churchill's head. I think it quite suits him. But, um, <laughs> but that idea of defiling such a monument like that, such, a, uh, such an important person within the history of the UK. But equally, uh, this is absolutely tremendous, isn't it? Um, in, uh, this is in Russia, and I got this out of the newspaper. I, I just scanned this from the paper. But that idea of taking something and changing it. So you've still got the memory of what was there. You can still understand what it was saying to us. But just by painting it, it's completely undermined, undermined it and changed its quality. And it becomes, I mean, the... <laughs> I think it's the Father Christmas that I like the most in there, rather than the... Uh. But again, this is in uh, Vancouver. And these, uh, silo, these concrete silos, which they're still being used. There was uh, concrete being collected from them as, uh, as I was taking this picture and being, still being poured into these silos. But all of a sudden, this, this, is in, um, this is in the centre on Granville Island. And it becomes friendly. It's, it's moved from this piece of industry on the edge of the island into the friendly and accessible and just sort of, oh, aren't they lovely? Sort of things. And again, the, that sense of reclaiming things or claiming things. And... Again, we could say, and you'll, you might have to correct me on some of this because I've just got this from the um, internet, the history of the, the forks, but you get this sense of a cultural history going on with 
um, the, the forks itself and how it's evolved, how it's changed, and how it's moved from uh, an area uh, which was incredibly important um, to the sort of, certainly the, the pre-European cultures, in pre incredibly important to the, the first people who, who came here. Um, effectively, the railway cut it off and did a huge amount of damage to that as an accessible area. But in recent years, it started to be reclaimed. I think it says 18, 1989, this sort of, these first proposals. And you can see from the language, it's, it's sort of postmodern. Look at these nice columns here with the bases and the, that sort of, that language is very, very much of the late, eight, uh, late 80s, early 19. 90s, and this is uh, some of the, the first iterations of those new interiors, and that's such a jolly marketplace, people coming in. It's, uh, it has been updated now, and that sort of post-industrial um, aesthetic is really uh, what's the overriding uh, message that's coming across this. So things evolve, things, things change, and that's sort of, that is what time, that's what time does. And so... One of the significant things about all of these buildings is that they're, and one of the significant things about adaptive reuse is that, remember when you first started education and they said form follows function? Well, form doesn't follow function in adaptive reuse. Form follows form. So the form of the original building is a massive influencer on the form of the resultant adapt adaptation. And it's a form, oh, sorry, form, form relationship. And it's the primary consideration within remodeling activity. So the focus of the project can be concentrated on the site, the place, or the situation. Relationships that exist between different textures within the condition of the location can be explored translated and interpreted. And thus, the form of the new is influenced not by the function, but by the form of the existing. This actually reverses the more normal form follows function argument. It turns it on its head. For now, the form of the new elements is dependent upon the form of the existing. So it's not form follows function, but form follows form. And this process reveals the true character of the place. It shows how the found qualities have stimulated something new, something that in a way, for the moment, completes the place. So, uh, just a couple of examples of this. So this is the Odile Dex uh, Phantom Restaurant in uh, Opera Garnier in uh, Paris, where Phantom of the Opera, which is, uh, is set, uh, which is why it's called the Phantom Restaurant, this is it. It's pretty, as you'd expect from a deal deck, it's pretty out there. It's quite extreme and it's quite uncompromising. Um, and yet, and there it is, sitting inside what was um, the area which, you know, uh, where the, the stage, the, the carriages would have driven under there to drop the people off in their finery before they went to the opera. Um, that's the plan of it. And that plan, if, if Odile Deck had just been somebody had said to her, can you design us a restaurant please? It wouldn't have looked like that. Because it's completely influenced by the uh, original building that it's situated within. So you've got these uh, huge great columns in there. And the new building just slides in and out. It slides in and out and round and between that existing building. So that idea of the new being completely influenced by the old, the language is radically different. The, uh, the function is radically different, and yet the form of the building is completely influenced by the form of the existing. If we look at the section you can see how this balcony sits into the double, triple height spaces within there, and people weave in and out of it. 
and the uh, structure itself doesn't touch the building at all. Even the glass from around the edges um, is there, there are seals in there, but it isn't bolted into that building at all. And we can see it sitting, weaving in among the structure there. This, uh, the storefront gallery, Stephen Hull, um, is a tiny little gallery in New York, which for art and architecture, um, it says. And um, it's, a, it's a little sort of long triangular shape. And when Hull, I mean, this is uh, 30 years ago now, when Hull was approached to uh, remodel it, sort of went into the building and he said, look at all these exhibitions that have been on there before. What, look, at the, look at the patina of wear. And he could see where it had been painted again and again, where something had been put up and they'd painted around it. And he said, these are the cuts we're going to make. So these cuts in this building, which pivot and pivot, so when it's open, the transition between outside and inside becomes incredibly perforated. But that is based on the idea that they've had decades of exhibitions within there. And you could see the long, thin triangle of the building and how the, how the uh, pivots open in there to give that articulated uh, facade. Uh, another one, a documentation center in Madrid. And this is in a, uh, an old, a disused um, metro station, tube station. And so it's very, again, it's very, very long and thin. So that's the, oh, sorry, that's the uh, above ground. And because it's a, a, a station for the Underground Railway, that's the uh, platform. It's now disused and it's become a, uh, an architecture gallery. And what's significant is it, between it is the relationship between upstairs and below ground, above ground and below ground. And then it's at this point this articulated point, and the architects put this huge U-shaped lecture theatre in there to mark this junction between uh, the above ground and below ground, but above ground entrance areas, below ground lecture theatre, uh, sorry, exhibition areas. And what happens in this space yeah, is that if there's a lecture on, they just pull a curtain across. Incredibly simple and straightforward. A lecture on, pull a curtain across, they, everyone knows it's a lecture. And that was, it, that was pretty uh, radical at the time, but incredibly simple sort of thing. But again, this sort of complexity that wouldn't have been achieved without uh, um, a being an existing building, without that relationship. And the factory, uh, Bofield's factory, uh, oh, it is this building. Now, Bofill, Ricardo Bofill, who you, you may have come across, um, his father was a developer, and they were designing, I don't know, over here somewhere, they were, they, he was developing, a, oh, it might be there, um, a village, a whole comple a complex of, of houses. And this uh, cement works wasn't used anymore. And Bofill said, I'd like to live there. So that's where he started. This is the starting point. And gradually cleaned out all the detritus, took away the dust, got rid of the uh, rubbish in there, and, and then said, it was only then he said, right, how am I going to occupy this? I mean, he has the advantage of his father was the developer doing it, so it's not like he had to do all the architectural drawings and then, um, and then uh, and build it. He could do this in this two-stage uh, process. And this is what it's evolved into, this sort of sense of a, a ruin and occupying a ruin. And so you can see the new bits, which are much, much finer. So they're using similar materials, but the language that's employed is so much more fine. It's beautifully articulated. It's, it's well detailed. So you get to understand the relationship between old and new. And as it's grown up, yeah. 
and this is the interior. And he went round the building and said, yes, this is where the sun comes in, this is where I'll sit, this is where I'd like to sleep, this is where I'd like my office to be. This is... So that sense of learning from what the building actually said to him. And of course the um, salt building in Vancouver. Now what's interesting, I was in Vancouver before I came here, and what I thought was really interesting about Vancouver, it's, it's in, not only is it an incredibly new um, uh, city, like, like, like Winnipeg, uh, it's very, very new, and you can see this, this building, um, and you can see what's being constructed around it. So it's just sort of left in isolation. But it's what, what we regard as important. What do we regard as buildings that are worth saving? and are culturally um, important. This is um, this salt building. Uh, as you can imagine, the ships full of fish come into the harbour in Vancouver, and then they're salted to preserve them. So that's why there's this huge amount of structure in here to hold these great hoppers full of salt to, to preserve uh, the fish. And it's now a, um, a sports bar, a heritage sports bar, which sort of seemed diametrically opposite to me, but it's, it, it really did work. There's my glass of beer that I had <laughs> as I watched the ice hockey, so, so you should. <laughs> but, um, and it was nice, it was great. I loved being in this, this building, it was a nice atmosphere. But then you start to think, why has this been saved and not other, not other buildings been saved? What, who decides what's a good building and what isn't a building? How can we reuse some buildings and not other buildings? And how come things can just get um, uh, knocked down? Now, I, this is like this because I just cut and paste it from another lecture. Um, these are buildings in Manchester, some of which have been just knocked down. This building, for instance, this tower, this is the university site. This is one of the major routes into Manchester. This is the city centre, you can just see there. And this was a landmark on the way into the city centre. Um, it didn't work. It was built at a time when it was all about streets in the sky. You can see the street in the sky right up here to separate pedestrians and students, especially, from the traffic. Um, there was no sense of it being part of, uh, integrated into the city, really. And yet... It was incredibly important culturally as this landmark here. Uh, it, was, it was just knocked down. They knocked it down. They was, it, uh, and they knocked it down really quickly before anybody could get their act together and think about saving it. So we've got these other problems as well. This one's actually been reclad, so that's been saved. Uh, and um, anyway, so this is a building. Um, this is the old post office building, the Zenith building in Manchester, which in 2020 was, as a, as a post-war building, it's been, re, it's been adapted and reused and remodelled. And uh, this, is, this is what it was like. Uh, this is the architect's drawings. And you can see the sense of it, there is a real connection, it's higher than it was. They've put another couple of stories in. They sorted out the um, fire escapes, which weren't um, uh, legal anymore. Uh, they uh, sorted it. They, they, re they gutted the whole lot. But just think about the amount of embodied energy within that concrete structure um, that has been reused. So Winnipeg, then you start to say, yeah, I've been to the Forks, it's really good. I really like the Forks, it was those, those great buildings. It's got that new, which I believe was, I thought it was based on a sort of teepee, that, that um, uh, swirling cloud with a tower coming out of it, um, which is nice inside, I liked it. And, but then you start to say, what, what buildings should we be looking at? Because it's the buildings that are just we're just getting bored with, we're just dissatisfied with, that we don't actually um, count as having qualities of... And just in the same way as 
uh, a lot of buildings which were knocked down in that post-war period. And certainly in Europe and in like uh, Penn State Station in New York, they were all knocked down, they've been lost, and we regret, we regret it now. And we're going to start to regret these buildings if we don't save them, if we don't look after them. And this is just from your website. There is a website saying buildings in danger. I believe this one's already gone. But there's that, that is their, their sense of collective memory of embedded energy and um, the sort of the meaning in these buildings that uh, it's important that we reuse them, that we value them um, because they're part of an evolution of a place and we can't just obliterate one part of that evolution but it also sort of leads on to this idea of sustainable adaptation and what a sustainable adaptation actually means um, because the embodied energy inherent within these is huge so how can we reuse those buildings and what what does that mean so this and I do have time um, to move on to part two of this talk um, what is sustainable adaptive reuse don't just react take action so it's not gobons. This is a developer who's telling me what this means. And these are the things that are put onto buildings to make them look sustainable. And they may have some use. So they're extras stuck on to the outside of the building in an effort to evoke a particular architectural style. That's a quote uh, for what a, a gobon is. And they're sort of windmills. There's, but they, they, they don't necessarily make it sustainable. They may save some energy. But do they sort of, what do they actually mean more than a sort of token um, attempt to become sustainable? So sustainable active reuse is an artful approach that recognises heritage combined with a positive vision for the future that can make an environmentally sound contribution to the development and redevelopment of the existing built environment and so provide a better useful and more appropriate place for a population whose needs and attitudes are rapidly changing. So two of the substantial challenges that the world faces at the moment are climate change and urbanisation. And given that already more than half the global population live in urban environments, and by 2050 it's projected that 70% of us will live in cities, all societies need to be able to accommodate growth while at the same time reducing consumption. And this situation is complicated by the fact that 85% of the UK building stock that will be in existence in 2050 has already been constructed. I couldn't find the figures for Canada, but I bet it's similar. It might not be. You're younger, more ambitious, so you might be building a lot more. But that's a lot of buildings that have already been constructed that we need to reuse, we need to understand how we reuse them. We can't just get rid of them and keep starting again. Thus, the existing building stock will need to become both more efficient and more resilient. And building reuse, refurbishment, restoration all contribute towards the development of the existing situation, making it useful and appropriate for an expanding and changing population whose needs and attitudes are also rapidly evolving. So, just a few figures for you. Construction, it's a diverse industry that includes activities that range from immense infrastructure projects to intimate conservation projects. And it makes a huge contribution to the GDP, GTP of any country. And at the end of the second decade of the first, because that's the figures I had, end of the first, uh, second decade, it's worth about £110 billion a year. 60% of this is new builds. So £45 billion is spent annually on refurbishment works. But if we're going to do it in a sustainable way, it would be worth looking at those three tenets of uh, sustainability and applying those to adaptive reuse. So there's environmental, fewer resources are needed. There's societal 
sustainability, there's economic sustainability. Those are the three tenets. And I always sort of quite cheekily add another one to this called inhabitation. And that idea that we can choose how we um, occupy space, but also as, these, uh, as architects and designers who have the ability to uh, imagine alternative futures, we can remodel buildings so that they are used in an environmentally friendly way, in a sustainable manner. And we can, we can not so much force, but we can encourage people um, by the way we design things um, to do that. So if we just look at some examples of this and then tie it all together. So few resources are needed. I mean, that's a sort of gross uh, generalization. It's not only fewer resources, there's the inherent energy within the building itself. There's uh, the energy used to sustain it, to keep it uh, warm, to keep it cool, to, to run the buildings uh, the way it's... Uh, uh, and the materials that are being used to, that, used to do that. We talked a lot this morning, I think it's really interesting. A lot of the talks talk about this sort of sense of connection with the earth. And we could get our uh, cladding materials and we could import them from China or we could get them locally. We could get some of the best stuff in the world that's constructed in Germany. But just the transportation costs involved in that and you have to measure all of these things. You have to weigh all these things up. Uh, what about the quality of the life of the people who are making these things as well? Um, so these are all factors that as designers you have to weigh up as part of the design process so this this is a really interesting building the old post office in uh, Bolsano and this is it post-war building three stories high clad in this sort of brown stuff um, and uh, tribus this is the the plan of it it's got a dual carriageway here and it's got a railway there and it's a pretty standard building, some staircase here, some stairs in the middle, open plan, offices, things like that. And uh, Tribus, first thing he did was put a massive amount of insulation on the outside of the building, not on the interior, on the outside of the building. And you can't always do that. I mean, this building, maybe, you know, its qualities aren't that great, so yes, you could do that. But if you were looking at a sort of Italian piazza, uh, palazzo, it might be a different question. And uh, this cladding um, is very much based on allowing sunlight in from different angles. You want sun to come in and warm you, but you don't want to become overheated. Uh, we all know how good natural light is for mental health, but not if you're burning up sitting in it. So there's that sort of that balance, which is what um, Tribus was playing with. And you can see um, how, how uh, the articulation on the facade works. There's also uh, ground source heat pumps, there's a green roof, and the tower at the edge uh, it is, does have solar panels on it. So it's not like gobons, wherever, it's incredibly controlled the way um, it's used. Now something else, and we'll, we're going to come back to this slightly, is uh, deliberate inconvenience. And that's a really significant thing within community sustainability and societal com uh, uh, sustainability. And this is something that is sort of both urban and interior because deliberate inconvenience in means that you're, you're deliberately making it more difficult for people. And you think, really? That's no, 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 that's completely wrong. But it's the position of things like stairs and... Uh, kitchens, encouraging people to meet each other, encouraging people to talk to each other. And uh, that sort of that sense of um, bumping into people, having a little chat. Certainly within an office environment, uh, people could come into their office, not talk to anybody all day and then leave. Well, that's one of the problems with working from home as well. So you make an office environment where if they want to go for a pee, they have to walk past other people. If they want to go for a coffee, go and make themselves a coffee, they have to walk past each other and they talk to each other. And therefore, um, 
the mental health of people, it's well recognised that sort of making people talk to each other is incredibly good and healthy. So these spaces that encourage that sort of interaction. So it's energy efficient, it preserves natural resources, it reduces waste generation, it improves air quality. I mean, that's, that's yeah, everyone knows that about that. But to apply it to environmental sustainability. So this idea of social sustainability is the ability of a society or an individual's lifestyle to continue in a way. And this is, I've not made this up, these are quotes from the, the wherever, I can't remember to continue in a way that suits their needs and those of subsequent generations. The values and spiritual aspirations of the people should be complemented in their environment and in the processes and activities involved, should respect their history, current needs, and future potential beliefs and rituals. So this so social sustainability, which is very much an urban thing, but we can also apply it very well to um, interiors. And another interior, um, a quite radical uh, adaptive reuse project is um, these, this office design. And it was an, I think it was an electrical works or something, this building. And uh, it's a fairly uncompromising uh, interior that they've created. And aesthetically, you might like it, you may not like it. But it's an aesthetic uh, decision that they've made to make this sort of quality of interior, this sort of raw concrete, lots of glass. But interestingly, the way the building's organised is, is very, very sustainable. Because as we were discussing before, there is that sense of community within that. And community interaction is encouraged within the building. Deliberate inconvenience. And you can see how the staircases have been moved into the middle. There's communal areas, there's kitchens, things like that. So people work there, but they're also encouraged to interact. It's interesting, when you see that plan, that could be any office anywhere, couldn't it? It's, um, it's quite, quite good in that respect. Another, this is uh, Manchester. I thought I'd bring an example from, from home with me. This is the northern quarter, um, uh, obviously just to the north of the city centre. There were lots of markets. During the um, uh, 19th and 20th century, uh, there was a lot of mills, a textiles trade was massive in Manchester. And a lot of this area was full of warehouses, things like that. By the 1970s, it was a bit of a no-go area. It was really, um, it was full of sort of, uh, um, there was a lot of prostitution and pet shops. I'm not sure why they go together, but they, <laughs> they did. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's not the sort of area you would, even the daytime, I wouldn't have walked down, down there on my, on my own. And yet now, it was renamed, it was reclassified, the Northern Quarter, rather than just Tib Street. Um, and uh, you can see a lot of new buildings there, but a lot of the old buildings. So there's a real sense of uh, combination of new, new and old within this space. Um, and... Uh, the, there was a change in the planning laws which allowed more people to move into the city centre because there used to be planning laws to say you had to have two parking spaces for every house, every um, housing unit. Well, that's just impossible in a dense urban um, situation. So abandoning that and all of a sudden you can get huge numbers of people in there, young people. And it's becoming a sort of a little bit of a victim of its own success really. But that sense of community there that's existing within this mixture of uh, new buildings and adapted buildings. Um, economic sustainability encourages a skilled workforce. Uh, it refers to the practices that support long-term economic growth without negatively impacting social, environmental and cultural aspects of the community. Yeah, to, to remodel a building, if we go it down to the basics, you need to be skilled. You need those skills. Um, and that uh, skilled people are paid more. So it actually, it does cost more to, to remodel a building than it does to knock it down and just build a shed on there, tin shed. 
but that, that uh, pride that comes with the work. But it also, and this is one of the dangers, isn't it, if we go back and look at this. What about gentrification? What about the sort of the people who did live here and have been forced out? So there's always that sort of sense as, once, as one area becomes more popular and gentrified, what that is the consequences um, of those. And that's sort of a, a very difficult one to actually come to terms with, really. And, um, but you can also start to, to look at Winnipeg as well in this respect, in this sort of uh, remodeling of the, uh, the Forks area. And what are the consequences of that? It br certainly brings money in to that area that wasn't there before. Uh, people are coming in, spending money. I went in yesterday and it was full of people. There was lots going on, despite you know, it being minus 29 in January. There were loads of people in there enjoying and there was some music playing and it was a really, really nice um, atmosphere in there. So, my cheekily added on one, remodeled to be used in an environmentally friendly way. It's behavior that actively reduces demand, increases efficiency, encourages a less carbon intense lifestyle and develops a respectful relationship with the natural environment. And as designers and architects, this is what we're pursuing. I'll just give you one example. This is the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation by Malcolm Fraser Architects. And this, was a, this is a building, do you know, Edinburgh is a, a very long, it's, not a, it's a very, very long, thin city. It's like a fishbone. And this is just one off one of the lanes of that main drag. And um, Walter Scott um, went, to, this was a school, when, and then it became a, a surgeon's, uh, a surgery, um, and then it was occupied by the university. And Malcolm Fraser Architects have remodeled it. And the materials that they've used, they've used local stone. Nothing comes more than 20 miles for this building. The timber that they've used within there, that comes from local forests. The uh, copper that they've used within there. Um, all of the, uh, the pipes and the wires that were in, in the existing building have been reused. I mean, obviously, it's been supplemented with other things. So those materials that have been reused as much as they, they possibly could. Oh, there we are. That's Edinburgh for you. And that's the building itself. And then within that, we've got these sort of central areas, these communal areas here, which encourages interaction of people. A lot of these uh, offices, you, you can hire space in this. So rather than people working at home, they can come and work here. Or rather than having a, an office, they can work here for a while. So that sort of community aspect that comes from communal offices. Uh, there's other things like the, uh, the lights turn off automatically after a certain time. There are, and I was talking to Malcolm Fraser about this, and he said there's some obvious things, like having the recycling bins. You do it, but we didn't do it in the UK. Having the recycling bins next to the other bins actually makes people do the recycling, and it's sort of basic things like that. So you've got this sense of all these tenets of um, uh, sustainability all wrapped up um, uh, within one, one uh, building. Here we can see the timber, the communal, the communal spaces. And um, even in, I know Scotland doesn't get, uh, even Edinburgh doesn't get anywhere near as cold as it does here, but for several uh, months during the winter, it'll be, because um, of the east wind coming in, it's not pleasant. It'll be minus um, two, three, four, something like that. We're not talking about <laughs> minus 20. But you still don't want to sit in minus two, do you? You still want to be comfortable um, in there. So one of the biggest problems, interesting, one of the biggest problems that uh, uh, the world faces is not heating buildings, it's cooling them. And this is why Google, at one point, they discussed moving to Alaska. Um, because the, the amount of cooling that they were doing of all those machines, but 
you know, the workers didn't fancy that. But even in Edinburgh, uh, there's a real problem with heat retention in this building. So all the heat that is uh, generated by all the computers and things is recycled and used within the building itself. So don't just react, take action. Thank you. so much Sally. Um, I know we're on a pretty tight schedule here but we may have time for a few questions and comments. Uh, we will have members with microphones that are able to provide to anyone with a question. So if they could uh, head right back there over to Mr. Alan Tate. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation Sally. Uh, when I was a student in Manchester in landscape architecture in the 1970s one of the popular mantras in architecture was long life, low energy, loose fit, which I think was led by Richard Rogers. And it begs the question of the extent to which in your course you actually look at initial design of buildings so that they can be long life, low energy, loose fit. In other words, that can be retrofitted without having to go through a lot of gymnastics to do it. Yeah, I think that's, that is a very, very good point that you're making is if all buildings are sort of so, um, I wouldn't say, I would say, let's say clever, that anything can happen in them. That one of your tutors at the time, I don't know if he was there at the time, Roger Stonehouse, I think he may have been there. He talks about the idea that 80% of all human activity can happen in a Georgian townhouse. Um, and it is a little bit like that, isn't it? If you, if you, make them so that they can be adapted, so that they can be reused, so that they can accommodate new users. But also, um, people want to own, they want to enjoy a space, they want to feel ownership of it. So if you start to make them so loose fit, are they that enjoyable to occupy? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Yeah, a difficult, a difficult balance to make. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we've been waiting for quite a few years to have you speak with us and we really appreciate it. And on a personal level, I want to say you've made my job teaching history and theory for the past couple of decades much easier. So thank you for your publication. Um, I want to ask a question that you touched on in your presentation, and I, want, I know time is limited, but could you speak a little bit about the relationship between adaptive reuse and decolonization? You, you, you spoke about buildings that carry difficult paths. Yeah, that sort of sinister dialogue that, that can that, exist. That carry the narrative of the colonizer. Yeah. What do we do with them now? Yeah, one of the, um, I, I would say one of the things you don't do is knock them down. Uh, and I think it's really important to remember things. And if we remember things, then they don't necessarily happen again. Or they become... Um, and, and one of the interesting things that, that... I just showed you one of the projects. We had a series of projects with the students who were looking... They were called Sinister Dialogues. Uh, who were looking at buildings that had have some sort of controversial past and how you can come to terms with that, how the building can come to terms with that and how the occupiers can come to terms with that. Um, and if you just obliterate it, then there is that sort of, that something missing from the history, from the uh, evolution in there. Um, and this is why I think it's sort of slightly wrong to just get rid of monuments, to get rid of to get rid of buildings, they can be, um, uh, what's it, desensitized in a way, or they can be remodeled to be reused in a different way so that their authority starts to be lessened. Um, and I, th I think that uh, the Sport Palace in Prague was a really interesting 
uh, example of that because it, it, it would have been ever so easy to convert that into an office block and leave it as an office block. But that idea of just touching on that reminder of these, these things that had happened is, is, quite, a, is quite important. And, and uh, as a country that's been colonized, <laughs> colonized and as uh, coming from the country that colonized a lot of these countries, um, there is that sense of uh, necessary, the necessary reminders of that in a way. I mean, you probably would be much more erudite about this than me, really, having... <laughs> but yes, I think this is one of the roles in... We've been talking about telling stories and that sort of narrative that's in, inherent within any building, especially one that evolves and changes. And that, inher uh, that inherent uh, narrative or the story can be read. And it is about you know, the responsibility of reading what is there and adding another layer of evolution to it. The, the sort of um, award gold medal winning architect, Sheila O'Donnell, O'Donnell and Toomey, um, did this beautiful interior in um, what was a Quaker chapel in Dublin. Now Dublin's a Catholic country, sorry, Catholic city in a Catholic country, and Quakers are, are non-conformists, they're, you know, they're Protestants or part of the Protestants and they um, so it wasn't allowed a frontage onto the main street so you just got into this through little passageways and there was a courtyard and a little building and it became the Irish Film Centre and it was it was just a little gem hidden within the city when the Irish Film Centre closed down and one they had this love, lovely screen where they were channeling Scarpa and they had this um, plaster, inlaid plaster work in there with a, temp uh, uh, with a tinted plaster. It was just glowed. Um, they just painted it green. They just got the old um, emerald green paint and painted it, and it became an Irish pub. And she sort of said, well, it's just another layer of evolution in the city. She was very stoical about it. And wasn't, I would have been most upset, but she just said, these things happen. And buildings evolve, they have stories to tell. And um, we, as designers, we can pull bits to the fore and push other bits back, depending on what our needs are and our wants are and the needs of the people who are occupying it. But there are certain things that are really important to, to come through. Yeah. And that idea of telling stories through reuse. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, oh, that is such a good question. That is really, really a good question because if you live anywhere in the world apart from Manchester, you support Manchester United. And if you live in Manchester, you support Manchester City. <laughs> Manchester City! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.